welcome to our October seminar for our 2023 virtual HOA Condo Academy. We're going to be talking today about legislative updates and hot topics. Um, as people are joining us on Zoom and Facebook Live, looks like we already have a lot of people joining us, 47 already and counting. Um, I want to just do some introductory remarks. So good morning and welcome to class number 10 of our 2023 virtual HOA and Condo Academy. We teach this HOA and Condo Academy virtually in partnership with the cities of Avondale, Chandler, Glendale, Goodyear, Mesa, Peoria, Phoenix, Scottsdale, Surprise, and Tempe. Uh, my name is Beth Mulcahy, and I'm the managing partner and senior attorney for the Mulcahy Law Firm in Phoenix, Arizona. I have enjoyed working with and representing associations, HOAs, condominiums, planned communities for almost 27 years. Um, my firm currently represents over a thousand planned communities and condominium associations throughout the state of Arizona. I also currently serve on my HOA board and I have for many years. So I think I bring an interesting perspective to these virtual classes because of my experience, 27 years uh, being a lawyer for associations, condominiums, planned communities, HOAs. And then also I've served my time uh, as a board member in my community. Um, but before we talk, dive into the meat of this seminar here today, I'd like to start off by getting a feel for who's in the who's in attendance attendance today or in our audience, um, so I can tailor the information to best serve you. So the first question is, which city do you reside in, or which city do you have a connection with an HOA in or condo in in Arizona? Um, we give you ten different choices, and then the second question that we are asking today is. Um, let us know what your current role is with the association. So are you a board member? Are you a homeowner? Are you a manager, a community manager in our industry? Or are you other, somebody that doesn't fit into that category? Okay, while we're waiting for the poll results to um, kick in, um, a couple of thoughts. Um, first, uh, let's talk about what's on today's agenda. So in today's agenda, we're going to talk about um, the HOA and condo bills that have been signed into law this year in our legislative session. Um, and then, and just so you know, the, all of these bills are going to be going into effect at the end of October. So it's important that you're aware of them and have them on your radar. So we're going to talk about the important aspects of these uh, laws. And then I'm going to give you a handout, which will help you um, navigate the new laws. And you can provide those to your board um, so everybody's aware of it. And then we're going to talk about the industry's hottest topics right now. Um, and, you know, as part of that, we're going to kind of get in and out of a lot of different subjects because there's a lot of hot topics that um, affect our industry. And I want to make sure that we have time to um, talk about them. Um, so some of the hot topics, just to give you just a little sampling, we're going to be talking about rental properties, um, collection of assessments, water rights, security cameras. Um, fair housing issues, technology issues, security issues, pets, sex offenders, handling media inquiries, removal of directors from office, dealing with difficult owners, dysfunctional boards, and um, also deferred maintenance. So as you can imagine, we have a lot to cover in the next 55 minutes. Um, before we do that, though, let's go back to our poll results and find out who's here today. So we have a great turnout of people here today. Thanks so much for everybody being here. We have 10% of you from Chandler, 3% from Glendale, 6% from Goodyear, 12% from Mesa, 7% from Peoria, 25% from Phoenix, 26% from Scottsdale, 7% from Sur Surprise, and 4% from Tempe. So really great sampling of our entire Valley of the Sun here this morning. So great job um, to all the neighborhood services departments for getting the word out. Um, the next question on our poll was, uh, what is your role with the association? So joining us here today, we have 74% who are board members, 6% who are community managers, and 20% who are interested homeowners. Um, it looks like we have over 100 people already on Zoom and more people joining each minute. So welcome to everybody. Okay, so let's switch gears and talk a little bit about the Arizona legislature. Um, for those of you who have been joining us, uh, you know, throughout all of our classes, which we do these, um, the Neighborhood Services Virtual HOA Academy, the third Tuesday of every month, um, we've been talking about legislative issues in Arizona since January. Um, this was a very unique legislative session in that it was really long. Um, and there were a lot of bills introduced that pertain to associations. 
ultimately only five bills passed uh, this year. And, um, you know, we're going to be talking a little bit about those five bills, but kind of the bottom line on the legislative session this year was it was very long. Um, there were a number of HOA condo bills introduced, but ultimately we only got five that, um, you know, the governor signed and became law or will become law on October 30th. Um, so really the first uh, topic that we're going to talk about is um, condominium insurance coverage, and this is House Bill 2251. Um, we're going to be giving you a handout, which is going to give you a deep dive on this topic. But generally speaking, if you're a condominium, this bill only applies to condominiums. Um, it does require some condominiums to have special insurance coverage. Um, it also would give each owner the right to report a loss under the association's property insurance policy. Um, and that's kind of unique in that um, typically the association board of directors is in charge of making claims on the association's insurance. So now with this new law, um, each owner would be have the right to report a loss on the association's insurance. So again, that bill 2251, House Bill 2251, applies only to condos. If you want more of a deep dive, click on the link we're going to be sharing on the new legislation. You um, know, the next bill is House Bill 2298. Um, and this talks, this applies only to planned communities. Um, and actually, there's a special set of circumstances in which this will apply. So um, you have to be a planned community, number one. Um, the second requirement is that your roadways have to be dedicated to the public. Um, and then third, your declaration would have had to have been recorded after January 1st, 2015. So for this law to kick in and apply to your association, got to be a planned community, number one. Um, the declaration had to have been recorded after January 1st, um, 2015. And then lastly, um, the roads in your community would have to be public roadways or dedicated to the public, um, another entity. Um, so basically what happens is, is if you are in that category of planned communities, you are required um, to hold a meeting of the membership. Um, to vote on whether or not the association can continue to regulate the roadways in their community. Um, and this needs to be done by a date certain. And so I encourage you, please, to click on the link for more details on this if you're an association that falls under this category. Okay, next bill is House Bill 2301. This applies to condominiums and planned communities. I honestly really don't see this bill coming into play that often, um, but um, as we've seen over the past four, four or five years, we've seen a lot of political bills. Um, and if you are you know, in an HOA or a condominium, this bill would allow the association to prohibit a person who is not accompanied by a unit owner or a resident of the association from entering the association's property if the association restricts vehicular or pedestrian access to, you know, encourage signing of a political petition or to um, encourage signing regarding a proposition or um, some initiative that they are trying to get passed. Um, so bottom line is this isn't going to apply very often. It has to be a gated community, number one. So if it's a condo or a planned community, that's a gated community. Um, the association could prohibit somebody from coming in to do political activities unless that person is accompanied by a unit owner or a resident. Okay, next bill, board member removal. This is House Bill 2607. This applies to both planning communities and condominiums. This is a pretty serious bill, so I think everybody needs to be aware of this. The bottom line on this is, is if you don't follow the procedures correctly, after a board removal petition is submitted to the board of directors for a condominium or plan community, there are very serious consequences for the board. And so basically what it does is it adds a deadline to the board to act upon receipt of a petition that calls for removal of a member. Now, we always had a deadline before, like once the petition is submitted to remove the director or directors, what the law previously has said is that you have 30 days, the board has 30 days to notice, call, and conduct a board removal meeting for whoever the person is that's being removed. And it's just like kind of an annual meeting, the same type of thing, it's a meeting of the membership, et cetera. The add-on with this new law is that if the board fails to call, notice, and hold a special meeting within 30 days after receipt of the petition, the members of the board that are currently serving are deemed removed 
from office effective midnight on the 31st day. So there's a really serious consequence now that didn't exist in this law prior to this legislative session. So again, if you are a planned community or a condominium, after October 30th, 2023, if you get a removal petition for removal of a board member or the entire board, you must act and you must act quickly. Because you know, under this new law, if you don't call notice and hold that special meeting to remove the board member um, or board members um, within 30 days after receipt of the petition, the entire board is removed effective midnight on the 31st day. Okay, last bill, Senate Bill 1049 is on flags. I think we've seen a trend of flag bills um, over the past, you know, gosh, 15 years, basically, that I have I mean, I've been doing this 27 years almost. But over the past 15 years, we've seen a major expansion of the uh, types of flags that can be flown in, a, in an HOA or in a condominium. Um, and this year, the legislature expanded it even further. Um, basically, they said that the association, whether you're a plant community or a condominium, cannot ban any historic version of the American flag, such as the Betsy Ross flag. Um, so you can pass, um, you know, a restriction in your CCNRs or in your rules, or if you have something in your CCNRs or your rules that wouldn't allow this, um, this law will trump that in your document. So historic versions of the American flag, including the Betsy Ross flag, are now allowable to be flown in condominium and plant communities by owners on their property. Um, if you'd like a deep dive on these, this new legislation, please uh, click on our link um, that we're going to be providing to you here through um, Zoom and Facebook Live. Um, you also can find the summary on the homepage of our website at mulcahylawfirm.com. Um, one last thing I want to talk about is Proposition 209. Um, this is something that is not on a lot of people's radars, but it does have some importance that I want to talk about with you. So it, it was voted on, it was an initiative that was voted on um, in the state of Arizona, and it was passed. And it, it really wasn't necessarily, you know, something that people initially thought applied to businesses such as HOAs and condominiums. Um, however, it, it does apply. And just a, a brief summary on it is it makes it more difficult for associations to garnish after they obtain a judgment against an owner. And this would only be for judgments that were, um, you know, obtained after December 5th, 2022. But basically, we have to analyze whether or not we are allowed to garnish um, on a judgment based upon different factors that Proposition 209 um, sets forth, like how much money this person makes. And the percentage that we can garnish is altered as well. So um, really, the impact of Proposition 209 is that um, it doesn't apply per se to, you know, like board members. This doesn't directly affect you, but this directly affects attorneys that are trying to collect money on behalf of associations. We need to make good decisions when we get a personal judgment against an owner um, on how we're going to collect on that debt. Um, and we have to factor in if choosing garnishment to garnish their wages or their bank account, or the rent, if they have a tenant in the property, if that is a good idea based upon um, the restrictions that are set forth in Prop 209. So just wanted to let you know, our firm is very aware of this proposition, and we are factoring that into any decisions we're making on moving forward on garnishments. Okay, um, I believe that my office has shared the legislative update link um, with you. So you have everything you need to be ready to go on October 30th when all of these five new laws go into effect. Um, a couple things, just quick little FYIs. Um, it's holiday decorating season, right? As soon as we start, um, you know, October, we start to see Halloween decorations go up. And I, I love Halloween. It's one of my favorite holidays. And then we go right into Christmas, which is definitely Christmas and Hanukkah and all the other holidays that are celebrated in December. A really good time for a reminder about holiday decorations and associations. So we're going to be sharing with you um, a holiday decoration policy and some information on that so that you can keep that in your back pocket if you have any problems with over-exuberant holiday decorations in your community. 
Okay, let's switch gears and talk about our topics today. We have a lot of topics to talk about in the next 45 minutes. And so kind of the game plan for today is I want to give you a sampling of what are the hottest topics that pertain to associations right now. Um, you know, from my perspective, um, you know, what I want to do is introduce the topic to you. And then I'm going to give you a link to information if you want more information, a deeper dive on the topic here today. Um, that way we cover a lot of material, number one. And number two, I give you an avenue so that you can ask for more information or look for more information through the links that we have. We'll, we will be providing with you here today. So hot topics, it's gonna be quick in, quick out on the topics, and then we'll give you a link to where you can go to find more information if it's something that directly applies to your association. Um, so first thing I wanna ta start out talking about is green initiatives, because um, this is definitely a hot topic in Arizona, and we're gonna be talking about um, water restrictions later. Um, but just one thing I wanted to mention, by green initiatives, I mean like um, initiatives that are being set in place by our legislature or our state um, to help, um, you know, you know, have, you know, something where um, we are not overusing water, especially with the water restrictions that we have in place, and that we're using, um, you know, the sun for electricity, et cetera. So I just want to mention two quick things. Number one, um, last year there was a bill passed that says that artificial turf associations cannot prohibit artificial turf on an owner's property as long as the association, um, you know, doesn't maintain that area. Um, and so we have done a lot of talking about this last year. If you go to our legislative update from 2022, you're going to get a deep dive on that topic. Um, but it's something that you need to be aware of. If you are a planning community and you have an owner that wants to put in artificial turf, um, before you would ever deny that, you want to make sure that you reach out to your attorney and talk about it because um, the law is um, protective of that. And if it's property, their property, and, and they maintain this area, they are allowed under the law to convert that to artificial turf. Um, the second one I want to talk about is solar energy devices. Um, I had you know lots of discussions with associations over the past 27 years about um, the solar laws in Arizona. Um, another green initiative, right? Um, the encouraging people to use solar energy to, um, you know, heat their pools or heat their water within their homes. Um, one really important thing to remember, if you are an, an HOA or even a condominium, associations cannot effectively prohibit the use of solar energy devices. So bottom line, if your association receives an application for a solar energy device to be installed on that owner's property, and the board wants to deny it, or the board wants to find an alternate location or a different type of solar energy device that they think will be less intrusive or prettier to look at, make sure you're reaching out to your legal counsel because associations cannot effectively prohibit solar energy devices. And that is really broadly defined by the courts. The Garden Lakes case in Arizona you know, said that we can't make it more expensive. We can't, um, you know, make it more difficult for somebody to install solar. We can't um, make them install solar that's going to de decrease efficiency. Um, so you really want to do um, your due diligence if you plan to de deny a solar energy device application. Okay, let's move on from green initiatives and talk a little bit about rental properties. So, you know, over the past Gosh, six years, we've done a lot talking about rental properties because of the large influx of Airbnbs and home away and short-term rental policies. Um, you know, it's become something that is very common for people to visit Arizona and um, want to stay in a property for a short period of time. And they want the amenities of an HOA or a condominium. You know, they want to have a full kitchen and, and maybe it's more economical for them than staying in a hotel. So what I want to talk a little bit about on rental properties is that, um, you know, you know, a couple of things that are important to know. Um, well, first, if you, you know, how rental properties should be handled in your association first. So you need to look at what your CCNRs say. Do they prohibit rentals altogether? Now, if so, that's enforceable. Do they put a minimum time period for the rental, um, such as rentals must be 
30 day minimum, you know, rental time period, or do they say nothing? Um, you know, if there's a 30 day minimum rental time period, that's enforceable by the association. If your documents such as your CCNR say nothing about rentals, then it's considered that it's allowed. Um, even if you have a provision in your documents that says that you can't run businesses out of your home, um, Arizona law allows you to rent your property if your documents don't prohibit it. Um, and so you need to be aware of that as an association. That's a common question that I get. Um, another thing you need to be aware of is that landlords need to register their properties with the county um, and with the city that you live in. So if you know that there is a property in your community that is being used as a rental, you can go to the Maricopa County or your county assessor's um, website and you can look to see if this, you type in the address and you can look to see if the property is characterized as a rental property. If it is not listed as a rental property, it has a little key that is right on the, um, the parcel number showing that it is a rental property. You can snitch on them and call the county and the city that you live in and say that this is a rental property and it's not being registered as such and ask them to look into it. They will look into it for sure because they're losing um, tax revenue every time that property is being rented. You know, um, a couple of things to know, um, we can ask for certain information from a owner regarding a rental property. Um, and we have a great cheat sheet that kind of goes into this in detail that we're going to be sharing with you. Um, but basically, we can ask for a few categories of information, like the name and contact information for any adults that are occupying the unit, how long the lease is, including the start and end date, um, a description of the tenant's license plate numbers and the tenant's vehicles. And if you're a 55 and over community, you can ask for age verification. Um, we also can charge a fee for registering each short-term or long-term rental, and that's $25 per rental. Now, if the person is, you know, has a year at least, and then they just renew it, we can't charge that $25 a second time. If the owner doesn't provide all this rental information and pay the $25 fee, we can charge a $15 late fee for not doing that. Um, some things that associations cannot do that I think it's important that you hear from me. Um, we cannot um, ask the owner for the tenant's rental application. We cannot force the owner to provide us with the credit report or the tenant. We cannot ask for a copy of the lease agreement and make them give it to us. Um, and any other personal information that's not covered by the three categories or the fourth category if you're 55 and over community that we just talked about. Um, you know, a very common question that we get is how do we handle violations by owners who are violating our rental policies? Reach out to, you know, our firm or your attorney. There's lots of different remedies that we have from fining, um, from contacting Airbnb or HomeAway or whatever organization um, that is leasing the property and letting them know that, hey, this person is violating our restrictions. Please do not post this on your website as a day or nightly rental, um, you know, we can go to the Arizona Department of Real Estate, file a complaint there, um, and have a hearing in front of an administrative law judge regarding the uh, violation of the rental policies. We can go to Superior Court and get an injunction against the owner for violating our rental policies. So there's lots of different options that you have. Um, and, you know, a good starting point would be to reach out to our firm or your attorney to talk about how we can best handle this owner that's violating the rental policies in your community. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about, um, we also, I mentioned briefly, we have a great cheat sheet on this on how to effectively work with rental properties, which we have shared with you already, or we will be sharing with you soon. Um, that's a great resource and a deep dive on how to effectively manage rental properties. Okay, next question, delinquencies, owners who don't pay their assessments or other amounts that are owed to the association. Um, you know, we're starting to see an uptick in owners that are not paying assessments in a timely manner. It's been really interesting since the pandemic. Um, we were just kind of waiting in our firm for the other shoe to drop. Um, but because of so much federal funding and um, a lot of people not having to pay their mortgages, for many months, um, there has not been that much of an increase in the number of delinquencies in community associations, HODs, by communities, um, until really, I would say, about the past nine months to a year. 
Um, and so now we're starting to see an uptick in the number of delinquencies. And we just wanted to go over this as a hot topic with you because we're starting to see a trend. And the trend is, is that owners are more owners in your communities are not paying their assessments in a timely manner. So we want to go over just a quick little 411 on what you, do, you should be doing if you have that problem. Okay, number one, as a board member, you should be looking at your delinquency list every month. Um, and if you're seeing that owners that are more than you know 60 days delinquent in the payment of assessments, um, you should be giving your management company or your treasurer direction on how to handle it. Um, one of the things is the most important things I I'd like to stress on collecting delinquent assessments from owners is the sooner you get on top of collecting that debt, the better the outcome. So, for example, if you wait five years or six years to collect unpaid assessments, you know, an owner doesn't pay for five years or six years, it's going to be significantly harder to get that owner to pay versus you're right on top of them at 60 or 90 days and contacting them, putting a lien on their property, turning it over to the association's attorney to send a demand letter. Um, the faster that you act on delinquencies, the more likely it is that you're going to get the money um, paid by the owner. And the more likely it is that they're not going to do it again because they realize that there are consequences for not paying their assessments in a timely manner. Um, a couple of things to think about, make sure you're charging late fees. Um, the associations that don't charge late fees, there's no incentive for an owner to not pay in a timely manner. Um, another thing to think about is when it gets to the point where the matter is turned over to your association's attorney um, to collect the debt from an owner. And hopefully you're doing that early in the process. Um, we still, obviously we still take, you know, delinquencies when they're much later in the process, but um, you know, when we have, you know, there's six year statute of limitations. So we, we don't like to see, you know, getting these files five, six years into it because, you know, we may not be able to collect all of the debt based upon the statute of limitations. Okay. So what am I thinking when our firm is turned over a file from an association regarding a delinquency? So what our firm is thinking is we are doing due diligence on the front end to figure out how we can get the money. And this could be, you know, maybe the board tells us that the owners passed away, that you could be finding, you know, the heirs or finding out what's going to happen to the property or dealing with the reverse mortgage company, um, trying to get the debt paid. Um, if the owner is still living in the property and is not deceased, we do a full 360 credit evaluation of the owner to determine how are we going to get the money from them. We do that before we spend any money um, chasing after the owner, trying to get them to pay. So basically, we give a credit snapshot back to the board after doing some research. And these are the things that we find out about the owner. Um, number one, are they employed? Um, number two, do they have a mortgage or deed of trust on the property? How much is it? Are they paying it? Is there a notice of trustee sale saying that they're not paying it? Um, how much is the property worth? Do they have other debts you know, that are recorded and available online that we're seeing? Um, you know, do, that, do they have unpaid credit card bills? Do they have other people suing them? Is there a master association for your association? Are they also, you know, filing liens, reporting liens? Um, and so basically we, we come back to you with a snapshot of, okay, here's this person's credit and here's our recommendation to get the money. Um, and, you know, basically if the owner has equity in the property, so let's say that the property is worth $300,000. And maybe they have only a $75,000 mortgage on the property or deed of trust on the property. There's a lot of equity there. There's $225,000 of equity there. Um, when we see that, we're going to be encouraging the board to foreclose on the property because A, the owner's never going to let that equity you know, get thrown away and they're going to pay up. Or if they don't pay up, this is going to go to a trustee sale after going through the foreclosure pro or a sheriff sale after going through the foreclosure process, and an investor is going to come in and buy this, and we're going to get made whole. Um, of course, in Arizona, there are some restrictions on when we can foreclose, um, and those restrictions are that the assessment has to be one year delinquent, or it has to have twelve hundred dollars owed in assessments only. Um, so, really, the bottom line on delinquencies is get on them early. Do your credit evaluation of the owner so you come up with a good plan to get them to pay based upon you know what their 
project looks like. Okay, um, moving on to the next topic, um, we're going to talk about, and we have a couple of cheat sheets, just so you know, that we've already shared with you um, that give you a deep dive. You can find these cheat sheets on our webpage too. One is on effective collection of delinquent assessments, and then another one is on secrets to collecting delinquent assessments. Okay, next topic, water rights. Um, I think we're hearing about this all the time in Arizona, seeing newspaper articles. It's on the live news almost every week. Um, you know, the Arizona Department of Water Resources has declared a goal of sustainable water supplies by 2030 in Arizona. And what does that mean? Um, it means that there's going to be major water restrictions and reductions for associations in the coming years. And the Arizona Department of Water Resources um, creates, has created management plans designed to hold the state accountable for water usage. And there's been a total of five plans um, that were to be enacted over five decades. It started in 1980. Um, you know, now we're in 2023, almost 2024. So we're really getting close to that end date of 2030. Um, currently, we're in that fourth management plan. Um, and that started in January of 2023. And basically what this transition, you know, is going to require for associations is some small water reductions for communities that have 10 or more acres of turf. Um, and, you know, if you're one of those associations that has 10 or more acres of turf, like as common areas, um, you have likely already been contacted by the Arizona Department of Water Resources, and you hopefully already have some water reduction plans in place. Um, we're going to be sharing with you what the uh, fourth management plan is with the Arizona Department of Water Resources. We encourage associations to become familiar with this because this is something that is going to affect your association. The biggest water reductions are going to come with the fifth management plan, which is set to commence in 2025 or 2026. And this is going to reduce water allotments further. Um, and so, you know, these restrictions are going to, you know, likely force many associations to convert, um, you know, from turf to desert landscaping or, you know, large portions of your property. Um, and we've got a couple of links that we're going to be sharing with you on the differences between the fourth plan, which we're in right now, and the fifth plan. I encourage you to take a look at it. Um, what are some things that your association can do? Um, there are water management companies now that are actively reaching out to associations. I was at an annual meeting recently, and a water company came in, a um, water management company came in and gave a presentation on how this particular large master plan community um, could reduce water-hungry turf and reduce overall water consumption. Um, it can be a win-win because we all know water is a huge expense in most associations' budgets. So bringing in a consultant like this um, could be you know, a win-win for your association in that they're showing you how to reduce you know, future water expenses and um, still comply with this new um, fourth and fifth management plans that are being implemented um, in Arizona. If anybody wants the name of one of those water conservation companies, please reach out to me at bmulcahy at mulcahylawfirm.com, and I'd be happy to share the name of the company um, that I heard gave, give a really good presentation on this topic. You know, um, also start talking now with residents in your community at your annual meeting, maybe in your newsletter about future water challenges and these plans so that they're understanding and aware why you're converting the turf to desert landscaping. Um, and then really start thinking about ways that you can reduce water usage in your community um, by transitioning to desert or desert adapted plans. Um, you know, check to see if your city or town has any programs or grants to help your association. I was speaking with a, a city yesterday, a representative of the Neighborhood Services Department, and this person specifically told me that they have grant money for associations to be used for water conservation efforts. Um, and I mean, what a great opportunity. You know, this this particular city had, you know, like $75,000 that they would be giving out grants to HOAs and planned plan communities and condominiums to do this. So reach out to your cities, find out what sort of programs they have, because this is just dollars that you can use that are free 
after you go through their grant process, if you're approved, to convert um, your desert, your, your turf to desert landscaping to comply with these management plans. Um, for more information on water rights, you also can visit the Arizona Department of Water Resources website, and we're going to be sharing that link with you shortly. Okay, um, now we're just going to do some quick in out, in and out topics um, that are, you know, less meaty than the first few that we've talked about here today. Um, the first topic I'm going to talk about is board removal. And how do you handle a petition once you get in a board removal petition? Um, you know, we talked a little bit at the beginning of this presentation about the new law that's going into effect on October 30th. And that, that new law says that if you don't act within 30 days and have plan um, notice and actually conduct a removal meeting, that the entire board is removed on the 31st day. So obviously, that's a pretty serious consequence. Um, and so what I'd like to do is we're going to be sharing with you um, some information that our firm has written about the process of the board removal process and what the law says about it in Arizona, which trumps your association documents. I want you to be aware of this resource in case your association ever is presented a board removal petition. Um, reach out to my law firm or your legal counsel when that happens, like the first day you get it. The board receives the board removal petition signed by owners. Um, that is the time to act, especially in light of this law. And we're going to be sharing with you a handout with specifics on how you are required to comply with this particular law. Most important thing you need to know, you have to notice, conduct your special meeting of the membership to vote on the removal of the board member within 30 days of getting that application. Another just practice pointer from being in the trenches for 27 years, usually before you get that removal petition, you hear about it as a board. Somebody will come to a meeting and say, you know, you know, somebody knocked on my door this weekend and wanted me to sign something calling to, you know, hold the board accountable and, accountable and remove them for, you know, some things that they've done. Um, when your board hears that, what should you be thinking? You should be thinking, we need to have a town hall meeting to talk through grievances and air why people are upset. Um, because removal meetings are really expensive. Um, I attended one last night, um, in fact. And um, why are they expensive? Because you need to have your lawyer involved. And usually they are contentious and people start fighting. And that, you know, that makes you have to have your lawyer involved more and lawyers, as we all know, are expensive. So try to avert that by getting out to your homeowners right away, have a town hall meeting on Zoom or in person and talk about what the problems are. People will be less likely to sign a removal petition if the board is listening and understanding that people are unhappy. Okay, next hot topic, conflict resolution. Um, you know, Honestly, conflict, conflicts keep the lights on in my law firm, right? Because when people are fighting, um, you know, the law firm typically is becoming more involved to handle a difficult owner or maybe the board fighting. Um, you know, one thing that we try to preach to uh, boards that we work with and to anybody who is attending our classes is you really have to have a plan when there's conflict in your associations. And you're going to have difficult personalities. Okay? That is part of your job serving on the board. It's a part of my job serving on my board that I don't like. Um, it's my least favorite job, actually, of being on the board is having to manage people who don't get along or who are just difficult and just you know create a lot of problems for our community. Um, we have a great cheat sheet on this topic for you. Um, it's called you know how to handle you know difficult people. I really recommend that you take a look at it and give you specific strategies on how you can manage fights between the board um, and how you can manage owners who either are difficult and that they're not following your documents or they're extremely critical in an unfounded way about your board or maybe neighbor to neighbor disputes. Um, you know, and kind of one of the most important things I would say is reach out to our firm or your legal counsel if you're in a situation where conflicts are boiling over to the point that, you know, it's upsetting you as a board member, reach out to us and we can give you advice. We have successfully handled that many times in the past. 
reach out to whoever your legal counsel is and talk about it because oftentimes, you know, spending, you know, a penny on the front end will save you a lot of money on the back end. So we'll help you come up with strategies on how to deal with the difficult owner or infighting on your board. Um, you know, most of the time it involves good communication. And if the person has mental illness, how to deal with that, how to manage somebody who, you know, is so difficult and, and unreasonable that, you know, we have really no choice, but tell them, you know, no contact with the board. You only can contact the attorney, et cetera. Um, but we give you some great tips in this, how to deal with difficult personality cheat sheet. Um, you know, also if your board is, and we're sharing that with you. Also, if your board is dysfunctional, new hot topic, right? Um, also something that keeps the lights on at our firm. Um, how do we handle dysfunction within a board? Well, what we typically recommend is that everybody start attending classes like this because they're free. Um, and it helps everybody better understand what your role and responsibility is serving on the board and what the laws are that you need to comply with. Um, if you have board members that refuse to spend their personal time doing, um, you know, classes like this, you can always share um, our videos with them. Every you know, class that we teach um, is, you know, the video is saved. It's placed on our website at walkahealawfirm.com. You can go to exactly the portion of the seminar that you want your board to hear, and you can save that two minutes or whatever, and then we play it for the board in a clip. And, you know, saved as an attachment in an email. Um, you know, so education helps with dysfunctional boards. Another form of education is one-on-one -on -one direct. We go in and help dysfunctional boards in a class setting where we call it a boot camp. We come in, we have a specific agenda in terms of these are the things that, um, you know, after listening to the parties and hearing about the dysfunction, these are the things that we think your board needs to be aware of under the law and under your documents. And these are our suggestions on how to better manage the dysfunction on your board. Um, and also we open it up for, you know, the last part of it, maybe the last half hour. Um, and it's short. It's not long, maybe an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. The last half hour is for questions and for hearing grievances. And I have never come out of a boot camp feeling that that boot camp didn't significantly help the board act in a more, you know, reasonable manner, a more functioning manner. Um, so I really highly recommend that if you currently are on a board and it's just totally dysfunctional, you can't get anything done, everybody's fighting, bring in myself or bring in your legal counsel to do a boot camp to try to resolve these issues. Um, okay, last hot topic, and before this is a quick one, then we're going to go back to a few more hot topics, is talking about deferred maintenance and lack of reserves. This is a huge hot topic. Um, associations that maybe haven't kept up with the times, they haven't kept up with the maintenance, they haven't raised their dues or their assessments enough to keep up with inflation or the type of maintenance that's needed over time in your community. Maybe you haven't fully funded your reserve, and because of that, you don't have time. You don't have the money to fix your roofs. How do we pivot? What do we do? Um, we have some a great cheat sheet on reserves and the importance of a reserve study. So I'm encouraging you to take a look at that. We're going to be sharing that with you. Um, also, reach out to your trusted advisors. You know your reserve company, your management company, your accountant, your attorney, and talk about how can we move forward in a situation where we have a ton of deferred maintenance and no money. Um, and all of us have a lot of experience in helping associations manage that. Um, and sometimes that goes hand in hand with dysfunction on the board. Maybe you have people that think everything's great and you know they think it's fine to chain up the tennis courts when they become um, so you know not maintained that people can't even play there safely anymore. And, you know, that's not okay. You have a responsibility to maintain your common areas and you can't just be shutting things down permanently um, because you don't have the money to fix them. So um, deferred maintenance, lack of reserves, the two, you know, quick suggestions on that. Check out our cheat sheet on reserve studies. Reach out to your trusted advisors to help you with that difficult situation. Okay, next hot topic, security cameras. 
Um, a lot of associations are investing in security cameras, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this. Um, you know, some of these security cameras are awesome. It allows you to access, you know, security footage on, you know, from your cell phone in an office setting, you know, with a multi-screen view of all the cameras that are set around um, your neighborhood. Um, you know, remember a few things. So individual homeowners and condominium owners have a right to install security cameras, surveillance cameras on their own property. We're seeing a lot of ring cameras so that, you know, packages that are delivered, you're aware of when they come. Um, you know, one thing you want to remember to remind the owners of is that if you're installing security cameras on your property, um, that you are not, you know, pointing them in such a way that you're invading somebody else's privacy. So you can't be, you know, having that camera videotaping, you know, inside the neighbor's kitchen or whatever. So um, if you're, you know, approving a security camera as part of an architecture review, or you're getting a complaint from a neighbor about a security camera, um, just make sure that you're reminding the owner of the camera that they, you know, must only have it on their property. Um, also, we're starting to see questions um, from associations uh, about um, police enforcement uh, wanting to install camera systems in your community um, and then being able to access those cameras in the event of a serious emergency. Um, and this is kind of an emerging topic that um, we've had this question now from several associations where um, they're wondering, hey, is this something that we should do? Is this a good idea? So if you are contacted by um, you know, police or um, you know, authorities in your city or town, it's something you definitely should consider. Um, you know, I have looked into the issue extensively. We're going to be talking about this in an upcoming blog. Um, and I think it can be something that can be a win-win for both the association and um, the city or town that is trying to make everything safer for everybody. Okay, um, next topic that we're going to be talking about is uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, recently, CAI put out a publication, and CAI, just so for some of you who may not be familiar with it, it's a community association institute. It's a national think tank that provides free education, some free education and some education they have to pay for to help associations run more effectively. National group, they put out this really great uh, white sheet on um, how to, you know, make diversity and equity inclusion a priority in community associations. So we're going to be sharing this with you right now. Um, according to the Community Associations Institute, it's interesting to note that the most common type of discrimination claims that are made under the Fair Housing Act, which is a federal law that applies to condominiums and planned communities, is based upon ethnicity. And it often happens when we have neighbor to neighbor disputes, um, or maybe uh, somebody feels that they're being discriminated against by the association because they're getting violation letters. Um, you know, oftentimes um, there just needs to be some training for the board so that they know how to handle these situations. We have a great cheat sheet on this topic that talks about federal laws specifically the Fair Housing Act, um, and just reminds associations that we can't do anything um, to discriminate against any, um, you know, owner or resident in an association. Um, and it gives you some tips on how to handle um, situations between neighbors, you know, neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor disputes, um, and when we may need to get involved if there's a neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor dispute and somebody's claiming that they're being discriminated against. The association may have a responsibility to step in and intervene, um, or at least write some letters to both owners regarding the situation to make sure that the association doesn't have any liability. So in conclusion on this, it's a hot topic right now. Um, if you have an owner who is saying to you, I'm being discriminated against either by the association or owner to owner dispute, that's something that you need to escalate to our firm or your association's attorney to talk about you know, is this situation something that could turn into a lawsuit? Do we need to notify our insurance company? Um, you know, what types of steps can we take to limit our liabilities of the association? Okay, next hot topic is technology use. Um, you know, as technology changes, um, you know, it makes things easier for associations to conduct business. 
Um, a couple things that you should be aware of. Arizona law allows members to vote at meetings of the membership by online voting. Um, and a lot of associations are using companies to handle all voting aspects of their annual meeting or CCNR amendments. Um, so just wanted you to be aware that that's something that is allowable under Arizona law. So online voting. Of course, if somebody doesn't have a computer or doesn't want to online vote, there has to be an alternate method for them to obtain a ballot and then just mail the ballot in. Associations using a website for communication, another type of technology. Um, websites, Facebook, Instagram, um, all of these different communication aspects. Nextdoor is another example. Um, you know, just the importance of first on the association's website, having all the information at the owner's fingertips that they may need, like architectural applications, the association's documents, a way for them to look up there, how much they owe the association. Um, a lot of this is going to need to be password protected. Um, sometimes we see bang ups and problems with board members making comments on Facebook or Instagram that maybe don't represent, you know, the rest of the board, or maybe, you know, aren't professional. So just being aware of having a policy in place for your association about, okay, this is how we handle that on um, social media. And, you know, we typically, what I recommend to boards is be really careful if you're making a comment on social media about something, you know, it's perceived as a comment of the board. It's, it's you're a board member. So be really careful about that. So we have a great cheat sheet on um, technology that we're going to be sharing with you. Um, the last kind of technology thing would be, um, or last two would be, you know, using Zoom or uh, virtual meetings to have your board meetings. I would say that 95 to 98% of my meetings are now virtual with boards. Um, I very rarely personally attend board meetings anymore because of a number of reasons. The board, most boards are using virtual meetings now exclusively for their board meetings. They don't want to pay the attorney for the travel time. So they want the attorney to come in person or virtually versus in person. So it saves them money. Um, but this is something that is happening everywhere. So it's technology use. You know, we have a cheat sheet on conducting virtual meetings on our webpage if you want more information on that. The last thing I'm going to talk about is using email for board decisions. Be really careful about that because that likely violates open meeting laws. So all decisions of your board where a majority of the board is making, you know, our quorum of the board is making decisions needs to be done during the open board meeting. Avoid using email make board decisions unless it's an emergency. Um, and really there are very few emergencies that would you know, fall into that category where you have to go around having an open meeting. That okay, um, next topic that we're gonna be talking about, pets. Um, so we have a great cheat sheet on this. It's called Everything You Need to Know About Pets in Your Association. Talks about what kind of rules you can have for pets. So check out that cheat sheet. Um, also, we want to talk about assistance animals. So if you have an association where you don't allow pets, like sometimes in condominiums, and somebody wants an emotional support pet, or they maybe require a service animal, there are special requirements that you have to follow, and you may have to allow that, even though your documents don't allow um, having a pet, maybe. Um, the federal law trumps that, and you may have to allow the pet in that circumstance. So I encourage you to take a peek at that cheat sheet that we're going to be sharing with you on pets. Also take a peek at our fair housing cheat sheet that talks about um, the Fair Housing Act, which that would fall under if somebody wants a reasonable accommodation under the Fair Housing Act. Okay, let's talk a little bit about parking issues. Um, so parking is always a big issue, um, you know, Electric vehicles, charging stations, also a very big issue. Um, really, the best way to handle parking um, issues, um, check your documents. Can you enforce parking on the streets? Um, you know, who's going to do the documentation on this? Are you going to hire a third party? Is it going to be complaint-based only? What are your enforcement options? You know, can we send letters? Can we fine? Can we tow? Can we put a boot on the wheel? Um, you know, can we hire a company to come in and patrol between midnight and 6 a.m. every day? Can we put sticky stickers on the driver's window for violating the parking rules? 
Um, can we file a lawsuit? Can we go to the ADRE on this issue? Um, parking has a lot of, you know, aspects to it. And it, it typically is something that fires people up and is a problem that the board has to deal with. Um, and so I would encourage you, if you are having a parking issue, um, reach out to your trusted advisors, your management company, our firm, your lawyer, and we can give you a solution on how to best handle that. Um, electrical vehicle charging stations, um, very hot topic right now for associations, especially condos. Is this something that we have to put in? Do we have to allow an owner to, you know, install one on the common areas? Um, you know, probably not, but if they want to put one in their parking area that is their exclusive use area, we probably do have to allow that. Um, you know, we have a great blog on this topic, which we're going to be sharing with you, and we'll continue to talk about this, um, you know, as we, you know, navigate electric cars, which is something I think that we all can recognize is going to be a problem in the future that we need to have a plan in place for. So check out our blog on this topic if this is something that is of interest to your association. Um, our next topic is going to be, um, you know, sex offenders in an association. This is, um, you know, just a quick topic on this. Um, if you have a sex offender that moves into your association, how does the association handle it? Typically, you get a notification from the parole officer or from the police um, or sheriff saying that a sex offender has moved into your association. Um, what we recommend is that you provide that exact notice to your owners so that they are aware that the situation has occurred. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you tell people that there can be you know, no derogatory actions that are taken against this resident who's a sex offender that's moving in. Um, you know, you, basically the association is just notifying them so that they can be aware of their surroundings and aware of the situation. Um, next and last topic is dealing with the media. Um, you know, if you get into a situation where your board is being thrown into a media storm, um, we have a great cheat sheet on this. Um, it's called How to Deal with the Media. Um, you know, what you want to do if you're involved in a story. Now, I'm just going to mention this. Usually when the media is writing a story about HOAs or condos, it's not going to portray you in the best light. So you want to be very careful how this is handled. And um, so what we recommend is reach out to your trusted advisors, your attorney. Um, our firm has helped many associations navigate this. Um, really, sometimes the best response is no response, because no matter what you say to the media, um, it usually is portrayed in a negative light. And without both sides of the story, often the media will not even run the story if they don't have, you know, how owner and the association's position. Um, if you are going to have somebody talk on behalf of the association, designate one person with a script as to what they can say um, and determine, you know, after talking with your legal counsel, how exactly you're going to handle it. Okay, so we have perfect timing. Wow, we've been through a lot of topics. A few things I want to mention as we close out today is that we have some additional free learning opportunities that are coming up here in the future. Um, first things first, we had over 120 live viewers on Zoom and Facebook Live today. So thank you so much for the great participation and for being here today. So don't forget, Friday, November 3rd is our next virtual First Friday free call in where I answer questions for free until. All the questions are answered. Um, additional details on this can be found on our website. Questions can be submitted now through the morning of November 3rd at 8.45 a.m. And then we go online on Friday, November 3rd at 9 and answer every question that's submitted. Last but not least, we're starting to get into the holidays. And so in November and December, um, we have a few changes to the classes that we're teaching. So first things first, in November, um, instead of having our virtual HOA Academy the third Tuesday in November, um, we are having it the second Tuesday in November so that we don't um, interfere with any turkey making and family outings and travel plans of people who might not be able to attend. So in November, our virtual seminar is going to be on Tuesday, November 14th, so the second Tuesday of November. Um, and we have a great class. We're going to be talking about how to be a successful association 
And what are some qualities of A plus board members? So that's going to be a really great class for you to attend. Um, lastly, please consider leaving our firm a Google review. We are sharing a link in the chat right now on how to leave a review. We are always happy to get feedback about these classes and how we're doing as a firm so that we can continue to provide these classes to you and continue to provide interesting um, subject matter and change up our format if you don't like something or if you're really happy about it, it helps us because then we share that information with the cities that we're partnering with and they see the value of these classes. So we want them to want us to continue doing them. So giving us a, a Google review, letting us know how we do will be shared with them and we would very much appreciate it. So thanks everybody for being here today. Happy Halloween. Don't forget that all these new laws that we talked about today, the five new laws go into effect the day before Halloween on October 30th. Looking forward to seeing you in November and at future events. Thanks again for being here today and have a great weekend.